Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll visit Fort Ridgely State Park in southern Minnesota. But first, joining us now as our guest is the CEO of Lutheran Social Services of North Dakota, Jessica Thomason. Jessica, thanks so much for joining us Thank today. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, you're, you're a returning guest, but remind the folks a little bit about yourself, maybe where you're from, your background. Yeah. I'm from Park River. I'm from a town in the northeast part of North Dakota, and I've lived here most of my life, just out of the state for a few years. Uh, married with a couple kids here in Fargo, so we've been here for almost 20 years already. So then how did you end up with Lutheran Social Services? I started with Lutheran Social Services really in the affordable housing area to try to get some uh, affordable rental housing in rural parts of the state, and then just a year ago um, transitioned into this role as CEO. Okay. Well, before we get into the topic that we've uh, got you here for today, yeah. I understand uh, you've recently uh, gotten an award or been uh, for the forum uh, yeah. person of the year. Yeah. Can was, you tell us about that? Well, it was uh, very unexpected, but mm -hmm. um, I think they were just looking for um, some of their, you know, their top stories of the year, and refugee resettlement is certainly something we've been talking about here in North Dakota. So well, it's really not me, it's the people who do the work, but I'm the face, I guess, of it for now. Well, congratulations Thanks. for that Thanks. recognition. Uh, well, we got you here to talk about sort of a hot button topic uh, currently with, with refugee settlement mm -hmm. uh, as part of it. Can you talk about the Paris and San Bernardino attacks that and how they've impacted your job? Sure. Um, it's actually a, a really good question to start with because I think one of the reasons that this has been such a hot um, topic of conversation this year, this idea of refugee resettlement, is it's really getting mixed up in people's minds as to um, what are refugee resettlement issues, what are issues of immigration and migration, um, and there's, a, there's kind of this whole global context that, that goes on. And so I think uh, what I've really spent most of the last year doing is talking with people about really what is refugee resettlement in the United States? What is it here in North Dakota? And how is that different from what we're seeing you know, on the news and hearing on the news? almost every day around the world, including Paris and San Bernardino. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you may want to try to dispel some myths here or misinformation yeah. that, that's out there. How does refugee settlement work? And uh, maybe talk about some of the vetting process of sure. you know, bringing a family into North Dakota. Yeah, re resettlement in the United States is a, is a really very structured process. So that's one of the first things that that I like to remind people of is what we've been seeing on the news for so many months is really a very uncontrolled migration in Europe from Syria and countries in that region to Europe as they're fleeing civil war in their country. That is very different than what refugee resettlement is in the United States. So here, uh, and this is the process we've had for a very long time, um, people are first, so they, they flee their, their home country because of a threat, an imminent threat of violence, torture, or harm to them or their family. They flee to a, a neighboring country typically, they're almost always fleeing on foot, and they, they wait there for the opportunity to return home. That's really where most people want to go, is they want to go back home. But when it becomes apparent that they can't return home safely, then they begin working with the United Nations uh, to begin the process of being determined uh, if they are a refugee. So if they're determined to be a refugee, then they wait, and they wait. Um, the average, you know, is anywhere from 12 to 15 years, upwards of 25 to 30 years sometimes, waiting in a refugee camp uh, to have the opportunity to resettle somewhere. Um, less than 1% of refugees in the world are ever actually resettled to a third country. So if someone actually does get word that they will be resettled in the United States, which by the way, they don't choose, they don't get to choose where they're resettled, they find out. There are about 27 countries in the world that accept refugee resettlement. So if they find out they're coming to the United States, then the vetting process really begins in earnest, and the United States government actually controls that process overseas. So Department of Homeland Security and the Department of State uh, work together with the other um, really counterterrorism and security agencies, FBI, CIA, and others, um, to go through this vetting process. It's very lengthy. It's probably 18 to 24 months is a typical security screening process for someone once they've found out they'd come to the United States. Um, and there are many steps in that process. We can certainly talk about them if you'd like, but they are everything from uh, in-person interviews, which happen multiple times by Homeland Security officers, to uh, health screenings, to background checks that include kind of the biometric scans. They really are very, very thorough in um, reviewing each individual. Men, women, children, older adults, everyone is reviewed the same way. Um, and when, when the United States government is satisfied that they have the information they need, then and only then is that person given permission 
to admit the United States. It's at that point that they get connected to an agency like ours. So all that happens overseas. Um, it's, a, it's a very structured process. And uh, if, if they clear that whole process, then they're assigned to um, either one, they're one of the voluntary agencies they're called. They work across the country. We work with two of them, Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service and Episcopal Migration Ministries. And then the family gets assigned to a, a new home community like, like ours, like North Dakota. So once they're assigned to North Dakota then, does North Dakota do any additional vetting or how, how does that work? Um, no, we don't do, we really rely on the federal process for the security screening and the vetting. So what we find out, we'll get notice maybe a week to 10 days before a family's coming and we'll find out the size of the family, the age of the people in the family, language is spoken, if they have any special needs and the date they're coming. So we have a pretty short window of time to actually begin preparing, but we we um, understand that all of that um, work has been done previously before we're ever even introduced to the family. So how many uh, refugees does North Dakota take in in a typical year? So if you look at the last 20 years, our average um, statewide has been 400 people um, across the state. The last year, so last fiscal year, it was 506, so it was a little bit higher than that 20 year average. We've been seeing around 500 um, people resettled to the state for the last several years. Yeah. Uh, of course, several governors have come out and said they don't want any Syrian refugees coming into their states. Is that a state choice or is that the federal issue? Well, I, I think that's a conversation that's happening in a number of states around the country. But really, um, refugees are legal residents of the United States. Refugees have gone through all of the processes that the United States has uh, set out for entry to the country. So they are allowed to live wherever in the United States uh, any other legal resident of the country would live. So it really, um, you know, unless you were going to talk about starting to uh, decide who can live in your state overall, uh, which legal residents can live in your state, I, I think that would be a difficult argument to make. But I, I recognize that, that this was happening at a time when there were really a lot of questions and concerns and fears. But I, I think it really is important to remember refugees are legal residents of the United States. Okay. Well, can you talk some about the work uh, that you, that your group does for, you know, finding housing, jobs, sure. and then of course uh, helping kids even adjust to school, yeah. maybe even not speaking the language. Yeah, that's actually, that's really where our work lies. So we are the organization that helps welcome uh, new families into the community and really to try to help them begin integrating into the community. We also know though that this is a long welcome so it is not something that you can just do in 30 or 60 days. So we really do, we think about it a, a couple different ways. There's the welcome which is that first 30 days uh, and then uh, so we have pre-arrival, we have the first 30 days and then we have life after that. So in the pre-arrival in that couple weeks before people come we're, we're finding an apartment um, because they need to make sure that they have a place to live when they're here. We provide some very basic household items. Um, there's actually there's actually a requirement by the State Department that each refugee family have the same um, the same basic items when they arrive in the country so we make sure those are there. We begin connecting with schools and the other thing to think about in North Dakota about 90 percent of the people that we resettle are actually rejoining family or friends. So we're also connecting with their family and their friends and their support network. So we're all kind of on the same page and together when we're welcoming that family. Then in that first 30 days, it's a very busy time. So we are doing everything from, really one of the first things we do uh, is we help people get um, enrolled for a social security number because that is your key to being able to work. And we know that employment is a really, really critical part of, of your long-term success. So we make sure they get applied for a social security number um, they are introduced to their English language classes. Everybody within the first week is um, signed up for English language classes. Um, we connect them with health care, we connect them with uh, the schools where they'll be attending, and then do some pretty extensive orientations that include everything from what are the laws in your community, you know, what does it mean to live here, uh, what does it mean to be a parent in the United States, what's the weather, and how do you dress for it? And you know, especially when you have people who are moving here in the winter um, and are coming from a very tropical place, that's an important orientation to have. We have a local meteorologist who does an outstanding job of uh, really orienting people to winter. Uh, and so we do uh, a wide range of things with people as they are really getting settled in their new home. And then very quickly, uh, the families that we work with are able to find employment. We have great relationships with local employers in all three of the communities where we do resettlement. Um, and I think they just do a marvelous job of helping to integrate uh, people that often don't have strong English skills to start into their workforce 
and by default into our community because it's really one of the greatest ways to get integrated into a community is to work side by side with somebody. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference uh, between you know, a refugee and an immigrant? So the simplest way to think about it is um, all refugees are immigrants, but not all immigrants are refugees. So a refugee is someone who had no choice but to flee their home because of an imminent threat of violence, uh, death, or torture, or imprisonment, because of their religious beliefs, their ethnicity, uh, their political beliefs, whatever it might have been. An immigrant is someone who leaves their home in search of a better life. So they're leaving their home voluntarily. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that that everyone who makes that migration journey is leaving one luxurious situation and going to another. They probably had some pretty dire circumstances that forced them to make that leap, to leave their home. But it's, the difference is it's, it's voluntary. So a refugee truly doesn't have any other option but to flee because of that imminent fear of harm. A migrant, an immigrant, is choosing to make that choice. So I, I hope that, that's the way I think about it. All refugees are immigrants, not all immigrants are refugees. Okay, okay. good enough. Uh, how many refugees are there in the world? And maybe talk about, well, you have some, the crisis of escaping sort of that Middle East. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I won't remember the statistic precisely, but it, it would be easy to find. In 2015, um, I think, was the year where it was the highest number of refugees worldwide that we've ever seen, um, for sure since World War II. And um, I believe the number is upwards of 21 million refugees around the world. Yeah. Um, a, a large part of that, you know, spike in the number of refugees really has come from Syria and from that region of the world. They've been in, um, they've been in a very uh, violent conflict for a number of years. And as you really do hear the stories of people trying to live their life, you know, the thing we often forget about being so far removed from that part of the world, just geographically, we're really far away. So it seems like it's something um, that's almost not real until you really begin to force yourself to remember that these families had a regular life in their home country just like we have a regular life here. They were middle class, some were middle class, some were farmers, some were business owners, their kids were going to school, and then war happened. And it's been ongoing for a really long time. And there just has come a point where these, these families um, can't live safely in their home. And so they are, they're taking some pretty, you know, pretty dire steps to try to find safety for themselves and their families. So I think that's the thing that's important for us to remember is it seems so far away. It seems so foreign to us, but really they had regular lives in their home country just like we did. They would have stayed there until their dying days um, without looking to migrate to Europe, without looking to migrate to the United States, but for war, but for conflict. Mm -hmm. Have you been miffed about some of the media coverage that uh, has been going on about this issue in the recent past? Well, I know that um, I know that everybody's got a job to do, and and we are certainly open to any conversation on this topic. But it does get difficult to have, you know, to have a meaningful conversation when really we're starting from a basis of fear and perhaps less than all the facts. And so I think that's been a great opportunity this last year is to try to really make sure that uh, you know I'm trying to answer every question that's asked every time someone asks to get the information out to people. And I think that's what we really want, is to be able to get the information out that people really have questions about. Because you can't, you literally can't turn on your television or your radio without hearing something about refugees, about migrants, about immigrants, about crises related to immigration. And honestly, by default, um, because of the part of the world where a lot of the conflict is happening, by, uh, about Islam and Muslims, and really the connection that so many people have made with that entire religion and that entire group of people with terrorism. And so it, it is no wonder to me that people have questions. You, you can't not have questions. Where do the refugees are, uh, who come to North Dakota, where are they predominantly from? And uh, you know, how are they really getting molded into our community? Yeah, um, we've had, um, for the last probably five to six years for sure, and maybe even farther back than that, we've had three primary countries of origin for refugees coming to North Dakota. So Bhutan, uh, is really the, the number one um, country where we've had um, many, many families come from Bhutan, Iraq, and Somalia. So those are really our three primary countries of origin. I think the next on the list would be the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
Um, but really for us, the majority of our, our refugees have come from uh, Bhutan, Iraq, and Somalia. Okay. And your question about how they integrate into the community, um, I think, you know, for those of us who live in Fargo, West Fargo, Grand Forks, or Bismarck, you have an opportunity to see some of that firsthand. What's really, um, one of the things that I would ask people to think about as they kind of go about their day and you're seeing your community have sort of a changing face because you really are seeing a lot of diversity in our communities uh, more and more, uh, is that not everyone uh, who looks different from, say, a Northern European person and not everyone with an accent is a refugee, honestly. Um, there, are, there are, It's a fairly small number of people who come to our state as refugees, but we have a lot more people who are just moving to the communities because we have strong economies and we're a great place to live. You know, we keep being on the top of all these lists of great cities and great metropolitan areas and great states. Well, a lot of people are looking for a great place to raise their family. And so you have people who move in and out all the time, whether it's for jobs, uh, whether they're affiliated with the university, and some do come as refugees. But I think it's important for us to really just see people for who they are and, uh, and try to extend that hand of welcome and learn a little bit about each other uh, as best we can. Yeah. Can you tell us about uh, the, the Great Plains Food Bank? Sure. Yeah, um, we have, you know, actually refugee resettlement is a pretty small part of what we mm -hmm. do. Uh, the Great Plains Food Bank is um, an awesome program that has been part of Lutheran Social Services for more than 30 years. They serve as um, essentially the warehouse for food distribution for food pantries and other charitable food organizations that work in our region. So in North Dakota and some in Minnesota, some in South Dakota. They essentially collect food, either donated food like efforts like Fill the Dome and other, you know, the Boy Scout and the postal worker food donation drives. But they also work directly with food manufacturers, with grocers, with restaurants and others to collect surplus food and get it out to people who need it in a variety of ways. And they've had some really great um, innovations these last couple years. They do a backpack program with a number of schools around the state where there are a lot of children who their best meals come when they're at school because their families really struggle uh, to make ends meet. And so they go home on the weekends and wouldn't have anything to eat. And so they have a backpack program now where they fill backpacks with food. The kids just pick up the backpack. It's very um, low key. You know, nobody wants to be seen as that kid who needs the help. So they just, they just pick up a backpack that's filled with nutritious food. They take it home for the weekend. They bring it back on Monday. And um, it was a really interesting way to fill a gap that um, people hadn't really thought about before. What do kids do on the weekends? We know that free and reduced lunch are important during the school week, but we also know um, if you come to school hungry on Monday, it's pretty hard to learn. So it's just an example of one of the things that I think they've done a great job um, in their quest to end hunger in North Dakota. Yeah. What are some of the common questions your office gets bombarded with? Well, um, it kind of depends on the topic of the day. We've certainly, um, in the last few months, spent uh, much of our time answering questions about refugee resettlement and that part of our work. We've done it since 1948 in North Dakota, so we've been doing this a long time. Um, and certainly the countries of origin and where refugees have come from has changed, but really the nature of the work remains the same, that we are here to offer welcome and, and uh, a safe, fresh start for families who are looking um, for a new home. Um, but we also get questions about um, really families in need in a variety of ways. We have a, a pretty strong um, range of mental health services for kids and teenagers, and so we talk a lot with parents and people who work with kids um, for what they can do for kids and teens who are struggling. We have a, a pretty strong relationship with a lot of juvenile justice uh, and court system programs, and so we talk, again, a lot uh, with parents and and pastors even uh, for ideas of what to do with, with kids and teens who are struggling to find their way through a difficult time. Okay, how is Lutheran Social Services funded? Um, really th three different, I think of it as three different ways. So about half of all of our revenue as an organization comes from um, contracted work that we do with uh, either the federal government, the state government, local or county government. So public sector um, work that we do on behalf of those entities. Uh, about a third uh, comes from earned revenue, so it could be fees for providing counseling services or um, the residential psychiatric treatment that we do, housing, the rents for the apartments, so about a third uh, is there, and then the remaining 20% would be donated, donated dollars, contributions and, and grants and things like that. 
Okay. If people want to help out with re refugee settlement or welcoming families yeah. or really get more information, yeah. uh, even, even on Lutheran Social Services, where can they go? Who can they contact? Um, I'm glad that you asked because that's really one of the things I'm the most excited about for 2016 are, I think, some greater opportunities to give people ways to connect directly with families. That was pretty common in the 70s and 80s um, when you had churches and families directly working with refugees. Uh, we're going to try to, to reinstitute that in, in kind of a new way and give people a chance to be that welcoming, you know, ambassador to your community. So I would just suggest if people are interested to check out our website, we'll make sure that we keep that up to date with all of the current opportunities for how you can, can get involved. Thank you. Yeah, hey, thank we're you. out of time. Thanks so much for all joining right. us today. Thanks for having me. Stay tuned for more. Fort Ridgely State Park outside Fairfax in southern Minnesota boasts many unique features including an authentic reconstruction by the Civilian Conservation Corps of the 1853 fort, which was the site of many of the fiercest battles of the U.S. Dakota Wars. Fort Ridgely is actually one of the oldest state parks. Um, it was designated as a state park in 1911, and of course it was to honor the original fort that was built here in 1853, and then of course with the U.S. Dakota War, the fact that that was such a pivotal uh, place in what happened there, that was attacked here twice, and so the legislature deemed that they wanted to um, at least keep the fort in state hands. The Civilian Conservation Corps came in here, it would have been the end of July of 1934, Camp 2712. What they actually did was a lot of the groundwork. Um, so they were uh, doing a lot of the landscaping and they started building some of the structures. It's interesting with the, the CCC um, when they came here because they did things that were beyond just recreation. In fact, they built a couple of check dams in the ravines. They also built these stone benches and they built stone picnic tables. So they did a lot of things that you normally didn't see in other state parks. There was all these young men and I can imagine that they were always hungry and that no matter how much they were fed, that it probably was never enough. You know, they came into this camps not having much food for themselves. They would have been here until October of 1935. Then again, like a lot of those companies, they were moved out. And then there was a time of period where there was nothing happening here at Fort Ridgely. And then they brought in a Veterans Conservation Corps group out of Camden State Park after they had finished working at that area. And they would have come in in October of 1936. And then they stayed until the spring in 1938. And they finished like this building here, uh, the caretakers residence, the picnic shelters, the latrine. And then the unique thing about that company, they were the only uh, company or camp that did a historical uh, reconstruction. And they did it of the commissary of the original Fort Ridgely. And um, they were actually under the uh, supervision of the National Park Service. And they would have also went through and identified the foundations of the other buildings that would have been at the post there. Like a lot of those military forts, they were used by the local residents. And once the military abandoned them, a lot of the materials were just taken. In fact, the commissary was used as a barn for years. The other unique thing about Fort Ridgely, it's the only state park in Minnesota with its own golf course. That was built actually in 1927. And everybody, you know, that I've talked to love playing the golf course. Good shot. Horseback riding is huge here, and we have a group camp area that we get a lot of horseback riders that'll camp overnight, and some will just come in during the day. 
And so we got a lot of trails for them to go on. And we have a really beautiful campground right down along the Fort Ridgely Creek. And then of course we offer programs throughout the year. We have a friends of Fort Ridgely that pretty much every year uh, bring in something to talk about the stars and planets. They actually do historical um, dramas at the amphitheater over there in the upper picnic area. And so it's really just a nice park to come and enjoy the quiet because it is really quiet here. Well, that's all we have for Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.